word of God tonight. Brother Richard, so good to have you. And Miss Brenda and, and that granddaughter, I'm telling you, I looked back and saw you coming in this morning and I thought, man, who's that young lady they got with them? She's just grown up since you were here last time with us. And it's so good to have you here, brother. God bless your heart. Help yourself. Thank you, brother. Real joy to be back in the house of the Lord. And she is growing up. You can't keep them a little long. But uh, she's 11, thinks she's 30. <laughs> she's a blessing to us, and we appreciate her. Amen. And uh, God's been so good to me and Brenda. We thank God for it. I want to thank the church today for the offering and the good fellowship we've had. Don't like this, we can't shake hands, but uh, I guess we have to do what we have to do, don't we? But it's so good that we can be in the house of the Lord. Turn your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 7 tonight. You pray for us. This is a, because of this COVID, this is the third time we preached out this year. We preached several times in our church, but, but there's not too many people, people preaching out. The Bibles or anything else going on much, but maybe God's going to intervene here and let us get back halfway normal anyway. But we just have to trust Him, don't we? I do appreciate everything. Enjoy the good singing. I tell you, uh, Brother Roger, you've done a great job on that song this morning. I meant to tell him this morning. What a blessing. And Brother James does a good job of this leading the singing. Then I watched on, on this, this program here a while back. Just Jan singing that, Go Get God. Boy, I, I listened to that two or three times. <laughs> Boy, that's what we need. Go get God. Amen. Amen. All right, Judges chapter 7, we're going to read one verse. <laughs> Share with you tonight in verse 21. Let me get my glasses out here. The Bible said, And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fleed. Father, we are grateful for this time you give us God to come and assemble together in your house again. I count it a privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for this pastor, Lord, that has confidence in me to uh, invite me to preach in his church, and it's a real honor. I thank you for him and his wife and what a blessing they've been to our life. Thank you for every member of this church, and God, I thank you for the friendliness of it. And I just ask you to bless today, God, and use us for your glory. Help us, I pray, to be a blessing to each individual, God, as we preach the word of God. And God, I know your word will never go void. Yes. Just use us, God, and help us, Lord, and anoint us. Not only me now, it will be with all the men of God as he preached tonight and on across our country. Give them the message, Lord, and anoint them and use them, God. And that's the only thing that's going to change this world is preaching. And I pray, God, that you move and intervene in our lives. I'll help us to honor you and glorify you and all we say and do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, our pastor, my pastor, James Langston, was preaching uh, last Sunday. From this verse, he preached on uh, go with what you got. That's what they did. They, they didn't have much, but they had God. And while he was preaching that, God gave me this message. And I was working on it when Brother George called me the other day. God said, that's what I need to preach tonight. I want to preach on I want to stand in my place. I want to stand in my place. He said, every man, every man stood in his own place. Imagine that tonight as you see this, as we develop it tonight. And that's what I want to do in these last days. And we are in the last days. Yes. I don't, and I like that song they sung this morning, Old Fashioned. Yeah. If you pumped the blood out of me tonight, it, it'd be Old Fashioned. <laughs> Amen. I'm Old Fashioned. I like the Old Fashioned way. Thank God for it. I believe this Bible's true. I believe it'll stand when the world's on fire. And I believe it's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that people get saved. Yes. Yes. But let's look tonight at this. I want to stand in place. First of all, we have an introduction. In these last days, it's important for us to stand in our place. All of us to stand in our place. Why? Because first of all, well, there's a great falling away. Yes. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. Great falling away. Now, I've never seen so much. People, that's, I'm, I'm talking about me and Brother Lance saw the other day, people have been in church for years. Yes. It's just falling away out of church. Yes. Great falling away. 
And God said it's going to be that way. I don't like it. Now, I'm sure Brother George don't like it. But it's going to be that way. Then he said there's a great departing from the faith. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1. Departing from faith. People leave after seducing spirits. And going the wrong way. And going to these churches. That all it is is a bunch of noise. God, God's not there. They may have a... Fourteen and fifteen hundred cars sitting out there. That don't mean God's there. And God can't be there when they're preaching out of somebody, some other Bible. Amen. God can't be there when they're playing rock and roll music. God's not going to enter there. He may. He's on the outside wanting in. But he, they not allowed in. Then we said there. There's the form of godness. Second Timothy three and verse five. All these things is here today. Just got a form. One preacher said a form is a graveyard, but both ends knocked out. We're dead. Without the power of God, we're nothing. Without the Holy Spirit of God, we can do nothing. Amen. And it's a form of God. Then there's the forsaking of the Scripture. In 1 Timothy 4, 3, they want to endear sound doctrine. They want somebody to tickle their ears and teach and speak fables to them, verse 4 said. That fables is fairy stories. But I, I won't... I won't Somebody preach the word of God to me, don't you? Let's look at three things tonight. On stand, I want to stand in my place. First of all, I want to stand in my place in the battle. They are in a battle here. Let's fix it. And we're in a battle. Folks, we're in a battle in America. We're in a battle in the church. It's not a recreation room. There's a battle going on. I mean, the devil is fighting right now. He'd rather me not preach tonight. He drove us not have this church tonight. It thrilled him to death. Every church in America locked up. And you go in, over in Revelation chapter 12, and we see that he, he knows his time is short. That's why he's working. He's not working all, all, overtime. Somebody says he's working overtime. No, he's working all time. And he's trying to destroy everything we're standing for and we fought, want to be for. And there's a battle going on. And here we find... In chapter uh, 7 here, we find, first of all, oh, oh getting in thought, man, I got it made. I got 32,000 members. I got the biggest church around. And I got it made. But he preached a message on fear and lost 2,200. Thousand, excuse me, thousand. Lost 22,000 members. I can hear him going home. Miss, his wife said, boy, you messed up today. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you messed up today, boy. You made them mad. But listen to me. I'd rather have a few that's standing for this old way, standing for this book, standing for God, is to have a church full, house full, and not doing that. Yeah. Then, then he preached a message on unfaithfulness. He said, what do you mean? He, them, he said, them there goes down there and drinks water like a dog. You don't need them. But those who reach down there in the water and brings it up like this, well, that's faithfulness, see. So you're drinking like this, you can look around and see if the enemy's around. You don't even need to have a head down because the enemy's working. And so it was unfaithful, and he lost all of them but 300. Boy, she really put it on in. Now you just left with 300. God used those 300. Let's look at it tonight. In 1 Corinthians, 5, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 58 tells us, before we go on tonight, notice what he tells us there. Therefore, my brother, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God wants us to stay faithful and stand in here for God. Stand unmovable. He tells us over in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. He said, Wherefore take ye unto the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil days. And have done all, run. No, it said stand. So I want to stand in my place, don't you? I want to stay right where God wants me to stand in my place. First of all, we see in, in these verses, we see the planning of the battle. 
the Lord made the plan and used God's man to carry it out. That's the way it happens. God's the leader. The Lord Jesus Christ is upper, it's a shepherd. He leads, and he leads this man to lead you and all, all you. Now, let me say this tonight. You follow him as long as he's following this book. If he's following this book, you follow him. My first church, I'd have a deacon's meeting, and every time I wanted to do something, I'd say, table it, table it. I told him one day, I said, there's so much on this table, we'll never get it all off. <laughs> Amen. Well, we, listen, God, God speaks through God's man. And he's got to, he, he speaks to him to lead this church. Amen. But God has a plan. He's just to follow it. And that's what Gillian was. I'm sure, I'm sure. There's people said, you mean we're going out there fighting all them bunch? They look like a bunch of grasshoppers down there and here's 300 men. We ain't never done it this way before. I've heard that plenty of times too. But they had one thing on their side, and that was God. That was God. Look in verse, we see that in verse 3 and 4 about them. Look in verse 18. The Bible says, when, when I blow the, the trumpet, and I, and, and I and all that are with me, they blow yet the trumpet also every side, of all the camp and saying, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And in verse 21, and they stood every man in his place round about the camp. Every man stood in his place around about the camp. Now imagine this. I don't have a member that y'all got here. But if all the members of this church would stand in their place, and stand and not move, be steadfast and stand, it'd be hard for the devil to get in here. Yeah. Why? Because he's stood in your place. And that's what God wants. There's a planning going on. God planned it. Then God told them how to do it. But they never would got the victory unless they carried out the plan. Wow. And so we see, we see the planning. Then we see the position for the battle. He said there in verse 16, the first part of it, or verse, yeah, verse 16, first part of it, and divided the 300 men in three companies. Divided 300 men, three companies, the position. Let's look at it. Enemies down here, they go in, 300 men, that's 100 men in each company, right? And they circle around them. The position. They was right in the place where God wanted them. Then we see, we see the provision. God gave them a trumpet in one hand, a vessel in the other hand with a light in it. Amen. And he told them to go down there. And when I, when I tell you to blow the trumpet, you blow the, break the vessel and blow the trumpet and say, so of the Lord. Amen. Can you get the picture of tonight? Going to blow the trumpet. Hit that. And when they did, God moved in. Yeah. God let them see all them lights surrounding. They thought they were surrounded. The boy was in the right position. Can you imagine what it'd be tonight if every member of all churches across America would get in their place and stand yes. and stand for God? We could turn some things around for God. Yes. Now, I mean, and listen, I don't try to be mean tonight, but the biggest problem in America is our churches. Yes. Right. Our churches are not in our place. Right. Not, the voice is not going out. Right. And it, listen, it's no time to quit. It's no time to give in to them. They're testing us right now. It's what's going on in America. They're testing us. Right. They're seeing if we're going to stand. We're going to be true. And I believe it's time we stand in our place and let them know they're not going to run us. Why? God's on our side. We can stand boldly. We don't have to bow down. Why? God's on our side. God's on our side. Position. Look at what 1 Samuel 12, 17, verse 47. That's where David was over there. Little old six, about a 16-year-old boy, they say. 
And old Saul stood a tall, head taller than all of his men. But here they are in the caves, and old Saul scared to death, their teeth chowdering, shaking all over. Scared to death that giant, he's crying, give me a man. Give me a man. Send somebody out here to fight me. But old David said in verse 47 of First Samuel 17, the battle is the Lord's. He said, you come to me with, with spears and, and, and all this equipment. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of God Almighty. His friend, I want to tell you, he took that little slain, put that little rock in it and started swinging it around. He let it go, hit him right between the eyes. And old Bill, Bill Gooper said, nothing's ever entered my mind like that before. God let David kill the giant. Why? Because the battle's the Lord when he was in his right place. Then we see the, the period of the battle. Look in verse 19 through 21. So Gideon had 100 men and were with him, came unto him, the other side of the camp in the beginning of the middle of the watch, and they had but set to watch, and they blew the trump, trumpet and break the pitcher and were in their hands. And the, and the three companies blew their trumpet and break the pitcher and, and the lamp in their left hand and the trumpet in their right hand to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp. And all the hosts ran and cried and fleed. They thought they were surrounded. I can see them taking knives, killing one another. God won the battle. Why? Why did God let this bunch of people win the battle? Because every man stood in his place. Boy, I want to stand in my place tonight. I'm not, I'm not much, but I want to stand in my place what I've got to left time I got left to do. I don't know how long I got. I'm 77 years old. I don't know how I'm going to leave out of here, but I'll tell you what I want to do, Brother George. I'm going to leave out with victory in my mind, Amen. in my heart tonight. Yes. I, want, I, want, I want my grandkids, and my grandkids and my great-granddaughter back there, they think I'm the best preacher and don't you tell no better. <laughs> Amen. But I want, I want them to know that Papa stood for God. Yes. Yes. I may not leave a lot of money behind, a lot of things, but if I can leave that behind that I stood with God, yes. that's worth it all. Yes. Standing in my place. All these been times in my Christian life that I felt like running. There's been times I felt like quitting. I remember when I was pastoring in Tiff Tony, and I tried out at North Georgia Baptist Tabernacle at that time. And I named it Old Fort later. And I come back on Sunday, and they called a meeting. I reckon they got mad because I went and preached. I probably wouldn't even took the church if I hadn't done what they'd done. Just be honest with you. But they had a meeting against me. And I, I, as people stood, said things against me that, listen, that I'd preached their funerals and stood with them and cried with them and prayed with them. I left her that night and I said, I'll never preach another message. We drive, we'd live about 16 miles in a church over on Harrison Pike in Chattanooga. We drove home. I laid my Bible down. I said, I won't never pick it up again. I went to bed and rolled and tumble and rolled and tumble. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I was sitting on the front porch. In that classroom we was in, there was a football player. And he had a uniform. He threw his uniform over his back and said, I quit. There's three crosses on the back of that picture in front of the middle of the cross. Jesus said, I didn't. Amen. What did you do, Brother Richard? I preached Wednesday night. Been preaching ever since. Amen. Can't quit. He didn't quit. He had a, listen, if he quit, we'd be in hell tonight. But thank God tonight he finished the course. Now I'm going to be like Paul. I want to stand in my place. 
I want to finish the course. I want to finish the faith. Amen tonight. It's going to be a battle. I want to finish the fight. It's going to be a fight all the way. But we're on the winning side tonight. So God wants us to stand in our place. We're in a battle. And we just need to go by God's plan. And what is his plan right here? It's blessed old book. Amen. Amen. That's our instruction book. The problem is, we, we, we like we, when we get a, something new. Well, I can put that thing together. And you start putting it together, you get by half done, and you wonder, where does this go? Where does this go? Then you go to the instruction book and find out how to, how to put it together. Be best to go to the instruction book first. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. This is instruction book. This is God's plan. And the man of God is to stand here and preach this church and preaching the avenue of the plan of God. And boy, we're to follow and do what God wants us to do for the glory of God. Yeah. And man, what it'd be tonight if every man, every woman, every child stood in their place. Yeah. Stood in their place. Then secondly, not only I want to stay in my place in my, in my battle, but secondly, I want to stand in my place Praying boldly. If there's ever been a time that we need to get back to old fashioned praying, it's tonight. Prior changes things. Not only does prior change things, prior changes you. Amen. You can't pray without it changing you. Man, I tell you, I, I've been I've been down to praying before and and God showed me some things in my life, and I got it out, and he changed me. He changed me. Now look over in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. I'm glad we got a high priest. He tells us verse 14, it ain't Pope Paul, Pope Paul or who he is. It's Jesus Christ, right? And he says, in verse 14, of he, I'm in 10 with you. Hebrews. Here we are. In verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly. Boldly. Unto the throne of grace. That we may attain mercy. And find grace. To help. In time of need. God said we can come boldly. To the throne room of grace. Before my dad died. He lived down on Sand Mountain. I could go down there and go in his house. And if I wanted to, I could go to the refrigerator and get anything I wanted. Why? I didn't have to ask him, really. I would, just because I reverenced him, but I wouldn't have to. Why? That's my father's house. It's my father's house. And God said we can come to the throne room of grace. That's the Father's house. Yes. Find help in time of need. Thank God for the avenue of prayer. Now, I know I preached a little bit on it this morning, but I don't believe you can preach on it too much. Prayer. Let's look at, first of all, the prescription of prayer here in this verse. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Come boldly. We don't have to sneak in. We can just boldly yes. come to the throne room. Why? That's where my father is. And sitting at the father is right at the right hand is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's my high priest. Yes. I'm glad tonight I don't have to go down here on the side of the road somewhere. Where the man's got to wear a shirt around backwards with a robe on and he wants you to call him Father. And sit there and tell him what I've done. No. I got a, I got a straight shot right into heaven. Amen. I can go boldly. Now let me say this. If you've been saved 60 years, you've got the avenue to go in. If you've been saved one minute, you've got the same power to get to that throne of grace. God made a way. He's our high priest. The, they don't know it. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that priest ripped his clothes. That means he's fired. Don't need him no more. Amen. 
We don't, why, would, why would I go to man when I can go to God? Why would I go to man that can't help me? Yeah, sometimes it makes you feel good to confess it to everybody. That might make you feel good. But the problem is you go back out and do the same thing the next night. It's kind of like a man came to the altar one time and said, Lord, I want you to forgive me for stealing the chickens last night. Then, Lord, while you're doing it, forgive me when I'm going to steal tonight. Huh? Listen, we can go boldly. That's the prescription that we can go boldly to the throne room of God. Boldly. Then we see the plainness in the prayer. Come boldly. That's plain. It's come boldly. Not ashamed. Believe that God's able to do all things. Then we see the place of prayer. The throne of grace. Thank God for the throne of grace. Amen. That I, as a human being like I am, and frail as I am, can enter right into that throne. Boldly. Boldly. What a God. What a God would let his son come and die on an old rugged cross for me. And thank God said it's finished. Buried, rose again the third day. Went down and set it to the right hand of the Father. And because of that, Brother James, tonight, we can go straight to that throne. Now, why? He's our intercessor. See, there's times that I prayed, I don't even know how to pray. I don't know what to say, but I got an intercessor. Yeah. Says, Father, this is what he means. Yeah. He's making a mess out of it. Amen. He really don't know what he's saying, but he's a groaning. Listen, sometimes you do your best praying to groaning. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. God understands. God, why? Why does God understand? He knows our heart. Yeah. He looks at our heart. And he knows our heart. What a God. What a Lord we've got tonight. That we can just go boldly to the throne room of grace. Then we see the product in the prayer. Attain mercy. And find grace. To help. In time of need. Help. See this is. This is what good about it is. Sometime you don't know what to say. But you can just say, help, Lord. Huh? Help, Lord. I'm helpless, but help. This is your little old boy over here tonight, and I need some help. Oh, as I said this morning, I said again, sometime I need, need some grace. Amen. If you're going to pastor very long, you're going to have to have some grace. Amen. And then sometime you're going to have to have some mercy because sometime you would like to hit some people. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I've been pastoring 42 years. I'm not just a young chicken on this thing. But God's on the throne in you. Find mercy. Yes. And grace. And help when? In time of need. God's never early. He's never late. He's always. Right on time. Yes. He knows my need. Amen. He knows your need. Yes. He's good. I was telling him in the prayer room tonight. I was sitting back in the church the other Sunday while the pastor's preaching, and this thought come through on my mind. How man, God made this world perfect. I mean, he made it and looked back and said, Brother George, it looks good. Looks good. Made it perfect. Perfect atmosphere, perfect bodies they had. Do you know who messed it up? Man. And man's messed up everything that God's created. Mess. But over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came, went to the cross and died on the cross. In 1962, the Holy Ghost of God came to a little old blunt-headed boy down in Rosalie, Alabama, and extended to me an invitation to get saved by God's marvelous grace. 
And I got saved by God's grace. And when he sent it back to heaven, he went to a prepare place for me. And that place, no man can enter in that's got any sin or anything. And no man can ruin it because it's incorruptible. Faith's not a way. God, listen. These homosexual bones think they're going to die and fly into heaven. No. No. God's word tells me it's an abomination. In verse 27, Revelation 21 says, there's nothing abomination to enter in. Amen. And you, tra- you take that b- word abomination, go back all the way through the Bible. What it means when it first did, it means the same thing all the way through. It's abomination. Amen. Going to be a lot of people fooled. We get up there, we're going we're to see some people we thought wouldn't be there. We're going to see some people we thought was going to be there, won't be there. But do you know who is going to be there? Those who've been saved by God's grace. Aren't you glad tonight, before we go to the next point, aren't you glad tonight that God made a way for us down here to go directly to the throne of grace and find help? In time of need. I preached a message here a while ago, here a while back on helps on the way. You get down and pray and you need something from God. I bank to me, if it's asked in God's will, helps on the way. Helps on the way. Now look at the last thing. I'm talking about what I, I want to stay in my place. I want to stay in my place in a battle. It's a battle going on. I want to stay in my place in boldly praying. Then last, I want to stand in my place. Preaching with boldness. Preaching with boldness. Acts chapter 4 tells us. Now, you, they've got filled with the Spirit of God over in chapter 2. But you know, i got a problem. I looked down at my truck yeah, uh, day 4 yesterday and it's sitting on full. It's sitting about halfway right now. And that's the way I am. Sometimes I'm full, sometimes I'm empty. Amen. I've got a leak somewhere. And somewhere between chapter 2 and chapter 4, they got a leak in. The Bible said in verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Boy, we need to preach the word of God with boldness. Now turn to 2 Timothy. We'll end up here tonight in 2 Timothy chapter 3 or chapter 4. Notice what it said in verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort all long suffering and doctrine. I want Preach boldness. I'm standing in my place. Preach. I, I'm not talking about being a smart egg preaching. God didn't, call, didn't, God didn't call me to be a smart egg preacher. God didn't call me to call women fat hogs and curse in the pulpit. Man who curse in the pulpit don't need to be in the pulpit. They said that's mean preaching. No, that's stupid preaching. Amen. Not going to help anybody that way. You no, know, God, when I was passing over here at old, old Ford, I, I thought you had to be a hard preacher just to, just to make it. And I, I, I thought I had some Bible convictions. And I was over there in my study, laying on my face, my hands thrown out helpless, and saying, Lord, I need help. God said, you get up from here, he said, all you've got is man-made convictions. It's somebody else's convictions. Yeah. He said, you get up here and you get some Bible convictions of your own. If it's not Bible conviction, don't preach it. Right. Right. See, i got preferences. Amen. Yeah. Uh, I like a Dr. Pepper. Don't drink many of them. I like Dr. Pepper. You may like Coca-Cola. That's your preference. That's mine. Yeah. Some people wear a beard. My preference is only on a beard. That's just my preference. Yeah. But me stand up here and tell you tonight it's wrong for you to have a beard. Yeah. Ain't none scripture back. Matter of fact, there's more scripture back in his beard. It said they anointed Aaron and it run down on his beard. Yeah. 
And Jesus must have had a beard. They plucked it out. So that's not preaching. And I was telling them tonight, I, I'll call it the preacher, but it's the preacher. I was uh, preaching up in Rockwood, Tennessee. And I had a gray suit on and a pink and blue tie on. This man walked up and said, you ain't supposed to wear a pink tie. You're preaching, you ain't supposed to wear a pink tie. I said, sir, my wife bought this tie. My wife put this tie on me, wore this suit, and I'm wearing it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But give me scripture. Another verse he used on me, preach the truth in what? Love. Preach the truth in love. God turned this old boy around. I stayed in North Carolina for 27 years because God turned me around. It was a hard time up there because when I went on it, it was what I was preaching this while ago. I mean, you couldn't even, you couldn't even, you ain't supposed to put a stamp on on one of those magazine things because it's gambling, he said. Yeah. Just a Pharisee, amen, yeah. preferences. Let me share this when I'm going on. I was preaching down in, at Camp Canyon one time and two guys, I, on Sunday night I'd preach to a guy, and if I called his name, Brother George, I know you know him, but he had a mustache. They called me at the church and said, you're, you're compromised. I said, why? I said, you preached a man last night in the church had a mustache. Well, both them boys, now, don't, don't take me wrong what I'm fixing to say. You may wear cowboy boots. That's fine. Both of them had a, a two-piece, two three-piece suit on with cowboy boots on. I said, let me tell you something. My preference is this. I wear cowboy boots with jeans. But my preference is when I got a suit, I want dress shoes on. And I said, I could say to you, you can't preach in my church because you've got them boots on because that's my preference. Same thing in mustache. Right, right, right. God wants you to preach the truth yes. and preach it in love. Yes. Let me give you seven things we see in this verse right quick. We see, first of all, the style of preaching. He said, preach. 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 Isaiah 58 verse 1 said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. It means to preach. Tell people. One old preacher told me this several years ago. He said there was a time in our churches that we needed some teachers. We said the problem today, we don't need some teachers, we need some preachers. There's a different preaching. I, if I, I, I used to use my Wednesday night for teaching. I believe a pastor needs to teach. But when he walks on Sunday morning, Sunday night, it's good to be to preach. There's a different in there's a different in teaching and preaching. Teaching feeds your intellect. Teaching does feeds your intellect. Preaching lays a charge to you. You got to do something with that charge. That's why most people don't want preaching. They don't want no charge. They don't want nobody to tell them what to do. I had a little boy came to my office at a Christian school up at Faith. At Reasonable. Had a little boy come in the office fixing, he's supposed to graduate that June, that May. He came in about January. He said, do you care if I graduate early? I said, why? Why are you going to graduate early for? He said, I don't get out of school. I'm going to join Marines. I'm tired of my mom and daddy telling me what to do. I said, boy, you've got to wait and come and you. Wait till that Marine sergeant gets a hold of you. Amen. <laughs> You're always going to have some more. But preach. Preach the word. Thank God you got a man of God. How you know? I know him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I've known him for years. I don't know how many years I have known him. For 30 something years. God, I, it's been 30 something years since I went to North Carolina. About probably 35 years ago. Thank God for him. I've heard him preach. And matter of fact, if we weren't so far away, I'd be a member here. But uh, we, we it'd be a long ways to drive, so we just we don't don't mean we might not someday. But I love this man. You got a preacher, stand behind him. He's going to preach this book. Amen. Amen. That's what he tells. That style of preaching is preach. The scripture in the preaching preach the word. Yeah. The word. 
Man of God comes in the pulpit. He don't need to know what's going on in the, in the digest, reader's digest. He needs to hear this book. And Brother George, there's a lot of people mixed up about preaching. Some, think, some people think you're preaching just because you're hollering. You can holler all you want to if you ain't saying nothing, you ain't preaching. If you're preaching not feeding the flock, not feeding the people, you're not preaching. But I'm going to tell you, you, preach this book, it'll feed you. Amen? It'll feed you. And if you'll come here hungry, you'll get fed. You come here thirsty, you'll get it quenched. Why? This man's going to preach the word of God. The word. Don't need anything else. We don't need a change. We don't need to change book. This 1611 will get us through. Amen. Amen. It's an English speaking word for us. We don't need anything else. You know, I said this years ago. What's happening about the Bible is the young people is going to come up and wonder which one is true. And got so many of them. But I'm glad I got truth right here tonight. Laying on this pulpit. If you've got a King James Bible, you've got truth. Preach the word. Preach the word. Then the season for the preaching, he says, in season, out of season. There are times it's not in season to preach, but God said this preach. Amen. One old preacher told me, he said, he said, and that squirrel's nest up there just keeps shooting. There's a squirrel in there sometime. He'll come out. I found this out in preaching. I was a little farm boy down on Sand Mountain. I'd be out there turning the plow. I'd hit a stump. I didn't go around that stump. You know what I did? I backed that mule up and hit it again. Backed that mule, back mule up and hit it again. About the third time I hit it, it come up. So we need to preach in season, out of season. Sometimes it's out of season, sometimes it's in season. But we still need to preach the word of God. And this, this is what's amazing about preaching. Sometimes I, when I feel like I've done the worst, I get more people saying that's a good message. Yeah. Amen. You know what it is? God gets me out of the way. Yeah. He gets me out of the way. I remember when Bob Darby passed his church here. He said he went and come over to church one Sunday morning and his wife was sick. Stayed at home. So he went back home, said his wife, I forget her name, said, said how'd it go this morning? He said, God's got a lot of confidence in me. And she said, why? He said, he left it with me this morning. I've been there, ain't you? Yeah. <laughs> Just left it with me. Amen. But in season, out of season. Then thirdly, the sanctity and the preaching. Rebuke. Re rebuke and well, reprove and rebuke. I'll get it right in a minute. Reprove and rebuke. There's times you have to reprove people and you're preaching and sometimes you have to rebuke them. But let me say this to your church. Man of God may be reproving you. He may be rebuking you. But he's doing it because he loves you. Because there's something in your life that you need to get out. Don't get mad at him. Get mad at God. Then we see the strength in preaching. He said, exhort. Exhort. That word exhort means, means to plead. Exhort. One young preacher, Brother Langston, said the young preacher told him, he said, he, that is, when they ordained him, he said, he preached, preached a message to him, said, rebuke and uh, re reproof and rebuke and exhort. And he said, I took my church. He said, I rebuked and I re reproved and I rebuked and I proofed and rebuked. And when it come time to exhort, I didn't have nobody to exhort. What are you saying? We don't need to rebuke all the time. We don't need to be proving all the time. But it is a time. You know, them sheep has to be sheared. But the shepherd knows exactly how much to take off. And that's the way a true shepherd is. There's times he'll come in and he'll preach and he'll shear. He'll rebuke you and he'll reproof you. But all at the same time, he'll come back right behind it 
with that good old Holy Ghost save and heal you. He don't want to hurt you, but it's needed sometime to be rebuked. Amen? And then exhort you. Then we see the steadfastness in the preaching with well, long suffering. Well, you'll never make it in preaching if you're not long suffering. Take some steadfast. Then the schooling in preaching. He said there with doctrine. Sound doctrine. Preach this book. Preach doctrine. The doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of sin. Doctrine of sanctification. Doctrine after doctrine. This book's full of it. Somebody said some of these clubs and things they got today, you can't preach in if you're going to preach doctrine. Then you can't preach a book. But thank God for the word of God tonight. I want to stay in my place. And I hope and pray I've laid a charge to you tonight that you'll make up your mind right here tonight. I'm going to stand in my place. Now, don't be like young girl and boy was in my church in North Carolina. I preached a message on the biggest threat I have in pastoring. It's when I preach the truth, how many people will stand with me? That's something to think about. How many will stand with me? It was homecoming day and this girl come up to me while I was eating and said, preacher, you, nobody else may not stand with you, but me and my husband's going to stand with you. She never did come back to church. I don't need them kind, Brother James. I need them kind that's going to be there. If it's raining, it's going to be there. If it's snowing, it's going to be there. No matter what, they're going to be there. Just like the lady this morning that her husband died. She didn't have to come. You wouldn't have thought nothing about her if she hadn't come. Amen. Do you know why she's here? She loved the Lord. She loved the Lord. I'd rather be in the old house, the house of God than any place I know of. I was in college playing basketball, backslid on God, but every Sunday morning I got up and went to church. Why? Because I know that's where I need to be. Then when I got my heart right with God, very few Sundays I hadn't been in the house of God. Why? I love God. I love the house of God. I love the preaching of God's word. And I want to stand in my place, and I hope you will tonight. As they come to the song, that's the message God said preach tonight. Every man stood in his place. Boy, we need some prior warriors. Boy, I, I was raised in the church and had prior warriors. They could get a hold of God. My grandmother's one of them. You looking at me tonight, she prayed me in. I come in from basketball practice and or ball games at 11, 12 o'clock sometime because it's way off. And I'd walk by the back doors. I'd go in the back door on the porch. Bathroom's right there next to it, and I could hear her calling my name out to God. And you know, listen, you know what she's saying? God, Richard, needs to be saved. And whatever it takes, save him. Then he'd go, she'd go down the line. She'd call all of her grandkids to God and all her children to God. Save them if they're not saved. Bless them. She died several years ago. And God laid that burden on my heart. And there's not a day that goes by. I don't pray for my family. I got about 18 or 20 special preachers that I send a text every week. And I'm not boasting. And I don't want them to think that I don't pray. I pray for them. Two or three times on Sunday, God use them, encourage them, strengthen them, fill them with the Spirit of God. Boy, we need people to get a hold of God. If you ain't got nobody else to pray for, would you pray for this old boy? Pray. Pray. Stand for God. 155. 
Have thine own way. Are you going to stand for God? I appreciate your attention. I hope I said something that'll be a help to you and strength to you. We was fixing to come down here tonight. And my great granddaughter, Rai Rai, I call her Rai Rai. She said, boy, I'm glad they're starting early at five o'clock. I said, yeah, it gives me three hours to preach. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Amen. She didn't like that part of it too much. <laughs> but I appreciate everything you've done for us and we appreciate you praying for us, brother. In God good. Yes, sir. Yes. I better pull this off. I, I was preaching up in, up in Harriman, Tennessee. And we went out to eat. The pastor looked over and I still had this on. <laughs> so I better pull it off for a carry. <laughs> You'd be broadcasting around the world. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Bless your heart. If you'll stop and think about those folks who, in, in the work of the Lord and in, in the faith who have meant the most to you, it'll be those who have stood in their place. Amen. Amen. When, I, when I look around this building and, and I look back over the years that God has allowed me to be here, those that have been the greatest blessing have been those that have stood in their place. Not always, to, not always easy to do that. But I want to tell you, that's, that's the best way. I, I, want to, I want to finish well. I want to run the race well, but I want to finish well. I, want, I don't want to end up on the scrap heap uh, along the way. God help us to stand in our place in these last days. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Pray for one another and look forward to uh, the service on Wednesday night. Be much in prayer for Sister Nancy and her family during this week that God would give them comfort and strength and be a special help to them in, in these days. Brother Kenneth, would you lead us please here in closing prayer?